So why this webinar and why now? The crime of ecocide is broadly understood to mean unlawful actions that cause severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment. We can all agree this is a noble cause, but the devil, as always, is in the detail. What are the definitions and practicalities of enforcement? As many of you have heard me say, at, I, at ERCS, we talk about facing the triple planetary crisis of climate breakdown, biodiversity loss, and the pervasive pollution of our air, land, and water. And this is why we're really keen to explore how an ecocide law in Scotland might work to create an enforceable deterrent to the most severe environmental damage. So I'm absolutely delighted that joining us today, we have Anna Madrick from Stop Ecocide International, who will tell us more about the campaign to make ecocide an international crime. Then Monica Lennon, MSP, will speak about her proposed members bill to introduce ecocide law in Scotland. And we encourage you all to respond to the consultation, which ends on the 9th of February. So this consultation comes at a time of unprecedented interest in the possibilities of criminalizing ecocide. But it's ERCS's job to be the critical friend. And I will finish off by briefly outlining the questions ERCS is exploring on the feasibility and options for incorporating ecocide. At the end of our short presentations, about 10 minutes each, Benji will be chairing the session and will ask the panel your questions. So with no further ado, over to you, Anna. Thank you, Shivali. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here and speak to this timely discussion. Uh, so my name is Anna Madrick and I'm Stop Ecoside International's legal analyst. I'm currently on secondment as a climate advisor to the permanent mission of the Republic of Vanuatu to the United Nations in New York. Um, and I'm also a PhD candidate on ecocide law and judicial enforcement at the University of Bologna. Uh, I'm also half Scottish and studied my LLB at Glasgow University, so it's really an honour to be here and see firsthand how Scotland, largely led by Monica's efforts, uh, continues to lead international efforts towards widespread acceptance of ecocide law. Uh, so I'll speak a little bit to the international campaign and a little bit to the law. Um, so Stop Ecocide International, uh, pioneered by the late Scottish barrister Polly Higgins and our current CEO and co-founder, uh, Jojo Mehta, is the global advocacy campaign working to see ecocide, uh, severe harms against nature on earth and sometimes in outer space, inscribed as the fifth crime against peace in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. According to the most authoritative version of the proposed international definition, uh, which was drafted by an independent expert panel in 2021, uh, convened by the Stop Ecocide Foundation, ecocide is defined as unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. The definition considers the environment by the five earth spheres, so it's therefore inclusive of outer space, as I mentioned. Severe and either widespread or long-term refers to environmental damage of significant magnitude. So therefore that's spanning large sections of land, air or water, uh, as well as timeframes. Uh, the unlawful part of the definition refers to actions against the environment that are already unlawful. So therefore, ecocide law can provide a further degree of enforceability to existing environmental laws. Uh, wanton, the other part of the operative definition, is defined as clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. So this part of the definition could be used usefully in situations arising beyond national jurisdiction, for example. Uh, ecocide as a legal concept dates back, dates back to the 1970s and was even debated for inclusion in early drafts of the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court currently contains four crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. And increasingly, global calls recognize the need for environmental pr protection as ecocide to be added to this list. Potential ev examples of ecocide may be deforestation, large oil spills, deep sea mining, um, or any other kind of environmental damage that reaches the prescribed threshold. So on this, uh, ecocide is a crime with a gravity threshold, um, where the focus lies less on a specifically prescribed list of acts, but rather a general standard that can apply across the board. Um, and this is essential because we need to have an offence that can reflect the complexity of environmental damage, which, as we know, is rarely one and the same and often affects multiple environmental resources simultaneously. So a general standard is fair um, and it ensures that potential perpetrators of significant environmental harm 
shift the mindset from how do I avoid fitting into these specific lists of acts that are already prohibited by law to a more general standard of ensuring how do I prevent that level of environmental harm? So recall that ecocide refers to the most severe harms against nature, um, and it's not a crime to criminalize ordinary people for making a living. Therefore, ecocide law refers to a criminal law rule and penalty, a standard to ensure that the worst crimes against nature are guarded against by a deterring and enforceable legal standard. With a similar feeling to the fact that we have a criminal law prohibiting murder, not only to punish murderers, but because we recognize that murder itself is a serious wrong, ecocide law will not only hold perpetrators accountable, but it will also serve as a confirmation that the most serious harms to our natural world threaten not only the environment itself, but also all our, our other human rights. Ecocide law increases in popularity for its ability to speak to the heart and reality of environmental damage. Rather than a continuation of our existing system of polluter pays, ecocide law reflects the onset of a new environmental paradigm of polluter does not pollute, ensuring that those who commit acts or emissions that threaten vital ecosystems are liable for a crime. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, today, steered by the Stop Ecocide campaign, ecocide law continues to consistently emerge as a robust and practical solution for governing certain forms of environmental damage. Ecocide law has now been discussed at parliamentary or governmental level in dozens of countries. Um, following the definition of ecocide law I mentioned previously, posed by the independent expert panel, uh, momentum has been significant. Uh, just in the last few months, proposals of ecocide law have been made in half a dozen national parliaments over the, all over the world. Uh, the Pacific Island Vanuatu, who I'm working with, um, and Ukraine are both victims of severe environmental destruction via climate change and conflict, respectively, are both vocal advocates for ecocide law at the state level. Ecocide law is therefore strongly supported at state and grassroots levels, uh, with support ranging from, for example, the United Nations Secretary General and High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as business sectors, swathes of academics and the World Council of Churches and Pope Francis. Uh, the International Corporate Governance Network, a collective of the world's largest asset managers, has for two years in a row specifically urged governments to criminalise ecocide. Scotland's natural environment is of course world renowned, and ecocide law would reflect this understanding with an enforceable standard. It would deter a significant portion of environmental destruction and therefore leave time and resources for other remediation actions. Moves to integrate this understanding are beginning to take shape in the European Union. The EU has recently reached political agreement to prosecute offences comparable to ecocide with implications for 27 member states. While not using the word ecocide explicitly in the operative part of the law, the revision of the European Directive for the Protection of the Environment through Criminal Law sets out a qualified offence, whereby anyone unlawfully committing one or more of a broad list of acts, with references to the specific separate pieces of legislation that they derive from, in such a way as to create a certain level of harm uh, in this context, severe and irreversible or long lasting, will also be committing the more serious offence and triggering heavier sentencing and penalties. In the preamble to the directive, it's stated that this qualified offence would address cases comparable to ecocide. The EU text also underlines that even where such acts have an authorization, they shall be considered unlawful if a permit was obtained via fraud, extortion or coercion, which are themselves unlawful practices. Uh, but this is, however, important, as currently many environmental offences evade liability because they're technically caught by the scope of a lawful permit. So the, e the EU agreement on this offence is a highly signi significant and positive development, and it will serve as a minimum with which member states must harmonise, um, each in the best way that suits their own penal codes. The directive will now include provision to directly address specific severe cases of ecosystem degradation, including habitat destruction and illegal logging. It's the first time that a, legisl a legislative text at the European level has recognized mass destruction of nature as criminal in and of itself. So therefore it's a very significant development. Um, the EU's progression with ecocide law has highlighted some key considerations for Scotland's route to the potential addition of the crime. And there are certain disadvantages. Um, the most significant disadvantage of the EU drafting is the, is the terminology of the qualified offense um, is that it, it depends on a specific list of acts rather than the approach promoted by Stop Ecocide International of Gravity, which I discussed at the beginning of my speech. The European Parliament's position previously had been to endorse a general rather than qualified offence, which would ensure that any act causing the requisite level of harm would be caught by the scope of the crime. A gravity standard in the form of a general offence is important for a few reasons. 
Ensures that complex or newly emerging threatening actions against the environment, such as geoengineering or deep sea mining, are also covered. It ensures that those who commit serious damage cannot escape liability, such as by claiming they didn't commit an exact offence listed. And it also ensures that practice generally moves towards the prevention of severe environmental damage. This standard would therefore operate as a general outer guardrail, which could have a positive effect down entire supply chains. This also affects our general attitude to the environment. If we understand the severity of damage against nature, governments must be seen to be taking action against those at the top, whose actions disrupt and deteriorate our living world. So regarding Scotland and the international ecocide law campaign, uh, Scotland's only part of the Rome statute within the United Kingdom. So the full support of a Rome statute amendment would require UK government consent. Uh, so, however, given this devolution restrict restriction, um, a domestic crime of ecocide could still hold significant potential for Scotland's environmental law uh, and therefore protection of Scotland's environment. So Scotland's best remit would be, as Monica's proposed, to enact a standalone offence of ecocide, which is within competence. And this could have a range of benefits. Um, I don't have time to go into all in any great detail, of course. Um, but generally, ecocide law would provide the foundations of a new paradigm of environmental protection in Scotland, reflecting our duty to act as Earth stewards for present and future generations. At the heart of the ecocide law movement is the consideration of the biosphere as the common good of humanity, where we move from a consideration of the environment as a tool for profit to its independent respect. Ecocide law could also shine a greater light on specific issues in Scotland, such as the concentration of land ownership and considering who owns land and what they're using it for, as well as improving biodiversity rates. Moreover, the multi-applicability of ecocide law to different environmental resources can also greatly assist with better coordination and enforcement of existing Scots environmental law. Thanks to Monica, Scotland stands to lead in international efforts towards a strong and enforceable crime of ecocide for people and nature. In this spirit, I ask all watching to consider how they can help ecocide law, a legal articulation of a deep respect for the natural world, can spread in Scotland and beyond. Thank you, and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much to Anna for that really thorough and insightful uh, overview of Ecocide. Uh, we're now going to hand over to Monica Lennon, MSP, to talk in more detail about her proposed members' bill and what it could mean for Scotland. Great. Thank you so much, Benji. Uh, thank you, Anna. Always a hard act to follow. Uh, and indeed, thank you to Shivali for your um warm introduction at the start and to you and the whole ERCS team um, for not just putting on this event but for really taking um, this issue seriously and all the work that you do and again happy fourth birthday to ERCS. Um, I think Anne has done a really good job at setting out what ecocide is uh, and why we need to advocate for uh, international law in this area. So today in the time that, that we have, um, I'm going to assume that everyone is here because we're all convinced that we need to do something, we need to do more to tackle the very real threat um, of, of ecocide. But the question for us today is what should we do in Scotland? So as a member of the Scottish Parliament, I've been working on this proposal with many partners and stakeholders, including closely with Stop Ecotide International now for, for a few years. Um, but I've put this forward because I feel that ecocide law, um, whilst not a, a magic solution, um, it is part of the solution to the triple planetary crisis that Shivali mentioned at the start. And in the last couple of years in Parliament, I've been a, a member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Um, I've spent about four hours today on the committee, so it's very fresh in, in my mind. And we were doing some pre-budget scrutiny with the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Just Transition, as well as the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Land Reform in the Islands. Um, again, trying to do that cross-cutting scrutiny. And again, it just reinforces to me the need for system change. Because often when we hear politicians, you know, me and, and, and colleagues of mine talk about um, the climate and nature emergency, there can be a lot of focus on behavioural change. And at times I feel that that focuses on individuals around some of the important but, but small changes that we can make 
um, around travel choices, recycling and so on. But I really believe that we need a much bigger focus on system change and the biggest polluters and those um, key decision makers who are often responsible for the, the acts of long-term and sometimes irreversible environmental damage that, that we're here to, to talk about today. So I first took this idea of ecocide loss seriously back in 2021. And that was in the, the, the build up to COP26, which of course was being uh, hosted in Glasgow. So for politicians in Scotland, I think there was um, much closer attention than perhaps had been with previous COPs. And I was very interested in the work that SEI um, were doing. And I started to learn more about Holly Higgins, um, who you heard Anna mention, who was another um, Scottish woman um, and really spent the final decade or so of her life putting her heart and soul and, and everything into this. But as Anna also said, you know, the concept of ecocide um, as a harm is, is not new. This dates back to the 70s. But again, it shows that the pace of, of, of change and action can be so slow despite the overwhelming evidence we have. So again, you know, thinking about the, one of the remits that ERCS has around uh, policy and law reform, as a legislator, that was my way into this as well. What, what more can we do in Scotland? In some regards, we are seen as a leader when it comes to um, setting um, climate targets and declaring a nature emergency and having a lot of ambition and a lot of good intentions. Um, but we need action and we always need to think what other tools that we need to have in, in the toolbox. So I see ecocide law as being really complementary to other strands of work that the Scottish Government are doing. Um, the, the Human Rights Bill, for example, and hopefully the, the right to a healthy environment, um, other aspirations around land reform, around circular economy and the, the wider work around a well-being economy and just transition. Um, ecocide law is becoming um, pretty mainstream, I would say. So in 2021, when I started to talk about it in Parliament Committee and at the Chamber, I felt like people had no idea what I was talking about. And now we're seeing development um, across Europe and of course the decision that was taken by the EU just towards the end of last year. I feel that is a bit of a game changer. So even if I hadn't proposed a member's bill on ecocide law, the Scottish Government would have to um, monitor what was happening at the EU in order to, to keep pace around environmental protection law. So I think that's, that's interesting. And it's also looking around the world. Um, many countries um, are bringing forward ecocide law. Um, Mexico, Brazil um, are, are, are some examples. And of course, the work that Anna is doing, um, particularly at the UN, is just so um, inspiring. So it feels like we have to do this. Um, so hopefully the work that we've been doing in the last couple of years, making MSPs more aware, having good dialogue with the Scottish Government, um, haven't just sprung this member's bill on the government or parliament. So Anna and I and, and Jojo Mehta, who was mentioned, we met with um, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero, Michael Matheson, over a year ago. Um, I think while Anna and Jojo were at um, the COP and we were we were doing it uh, obviously virtually um, and our current First Minister Hamza Youssef met with Jojo and colleagues um, at COP last year uh, in Dubai. So um, to me it's very encouraging that you know the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and indeed the Minister responsible for biodiversity, Lorna Slater, have all had meetings with me, with SEI, and you can see that we're starting to get cross-party support. Um, I was very open about the launch in November, and MSPs came along, including Matt Ruskell from the Scottish Greens, and I think that shows that we can take a grown-up approach and a collaborative approach. It's about getting, it's about getting this right. In terms of the 
the proposal itself, I know many of you have already responded to the consultation or been in touch with me directly. I, I recognise many of the names on, on the screen, but I don't know everyone. So um, we are looking to you know, bring this into to Scots law to act as a deterrent, of course, um, in the hope that, you know, it would never have to be used. Um, but the reality is we, we are going to see examples of ecocide um, in Scotland and around the world. So when that happens and when we're able to prosecute, we need to have um, robust and, and serious sanctions that, that fit the, the crime. Otherwise, it's not going to be a deterrent. Um, so in the consultation in terms of sanctions, um, in case you don't already know, um, the proposal around uh, imprisonment is a minimum of 10 years and a maximum of, of 20 years. And I haven't just pulled those figures um, out of thin air so at present, the proposed um, EU directive contains um, a similar financial penalty that I'll come on to and a maximum 10-year prison sentence. And that's in line with what um, Belgium has proposed. And, and Anna can probably speak to that, that better. But I did have a look at um, current regulations that we have in Scotland. And for Ecoside to, to be a much more serious crime, um, I felt it was more appropriate to have 10 years as, as, the, as the minimum and to look to a, a maximum of up to 20 years. But of course, the nature of consultation is I want people to give their, their views on that. And some people have expressed a concern that, you know, we have um, prisons that are already um, full um, and overcrowded and, and, and that is true. So are there other ways that we could look at um, the justice system? And in terms of financial penalty, um, again, all the research that we've done has shown that even when fines uh, are imposed and they can run into the, the millions of pounds, we have um, certain corporations, I won't name any today, who more or less just factor that into their business model and they know they're going to get a fine and a bit of a slap on the wrist and they build it in and they still make huge profits and they don't really change those behaviours that I mentioned at the start. So this has to be, um, you know, painful for, for those corporations. And again, this is not about um, going after responsible businesses, but I did hear in the, the launch of the consultation, the event that we had in the storytelling centre, that, that responsible businesses welcome these proposals and it also protects them from um, these um, you know, big polluters who want to undercut everyone else and those that are usually responsible for, for greenwashing when it um, arises. So um, the financial sanctions um, would be worth up to 10% turnover for companies that's based over a three year period. And when we talk about responsible officers, um, you know, we're meaning company directors, um, or sort of controlling minds, if you like. Uh, also, we cover limited liability partnerships or other entities which are not an individual, but where there is evidence that um, they directly contributed to to a crime. Um, so I have been doing a bit of work to reassure my local constituents that we're not talking about very low level pollution, although we want to make sure that that, that is dealt with robustly too. But it is thinking about some of those um, really serious examples that, that Anna gave uh, around um, deep sea mining, oil spills, uh, deforestation and, and so on. So today is, is great timing for me because as Shivali said, um, there's not long to go with the consultation. It closes um, a week on Friday, the 9th of February. The response so far um, has been very encouraging. Uh, my small team are going to be kept very, very busy analysing the responses, um, but I don't want us to stop there. I want us to have as many views and voices as possible. So please, if you haven't done so already, please respond to the consultation. It doesn't take very long, but if you do have a particular expertise or, or knowledge that, that you can share, please don't be modest. It's really helpful in the consultation if we can capture um, different perspectives and understand why people 
are motivated to respond. So if you have a particular research interest or an expertise in a particular industry uh, or an aspect of, of the law, please, please do share that. Um, and if you are supportive of the aims but a bit skeptical about how it would work in practice again please do share that in the consultation this is about testing out different proposals and um, what i'll maybe say to, to finish up my remarks because i'm really keen that we get a good discussion is that um you've heard from anna the the definition that was um that came from the independent expert panel you know really you know highly regarded people this is a very credible piece of work this is a definition that I've used for the purpose of this consultation. Um, and I think it's a really good place to, to start. Um, but of course, if, if there are um, views about how that, um, I suppose, intersects with um, other legislation we have, other definitions, I appreciate this is all very new. Um, so again, really keen to, to hear those, those views. But I'm very conscious that that doing nothing around ecocide law isn't an option. We do need to, to keep pace um, in terms of um, the EU. We need to absolutely do the right thing when it comes to our climate targets. Um, you know, we're not meeting them um, and we're not confident enough that we are going to meet them when it comes to biodiversity loss. Well, Scotland's one of the most nature depleted countries in the the world and when it comes to pervasive pollution that we heard from Shivali, um, there is so much there to be worried about, not just for all of us in Scotland today, but for future generations. Um, so I think we have the expertise in Scotland and elsewhere to, to get this right. I think that the government has a, a very open mind. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, pressure on me to try and make a persuasive case. And that's why we're having this 14 week consultation. But when that closes, that won't be the end of the conversation. So I hope people do keep in touch. But I will um, pause there because I have um, lost track of how long I've been speaking for. I usually talk too much. So I will stop there and hand back to, to you, Benji. But thank you everyone for your time, this lunchtime, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Monica, for um, sharing your thoughts on that and giving a bit more uh, depth to uh, explain about your proposal. We're now going to hear from uh, Shivali, Chief Officer of ERCS. Thanks, Benji. And um, yes, thank you, Anna and Monica. Um, so um, I want to now consider the wider problem Scotland has on environmental governance. And what we mean by environmental governance is the whole spectrum of how we administer, regulate environmental protection and how we do access to justice. So how we use the criminal and civil law uh, to enforce environmental protection. So, um, as Anna and Monica have said, the European Union are cu currently considering um, ecocide level crimes and the revised directive on protection of the environment through criminal law. And this is why ERCS has commissioned a report into um, how we can scope the feasibility and options for incorporating ecocide into Scots law. And we've commissioned this from two experts, Dr. Rachel Colleen and Professor Damien Short, and we're hopefully uh, very keen to have that report ready by the end of March. So to help inform their research, a couple of weeks ago, we organised a round table of specialists from environmental NGOs, legal and academic networks to grapple with this really thorny issue. How would an ecocide law actually work in Scotland? And I'm now going to share my screen to summarise the headlines from those discussions. So just bear with me while I do this. Okay, so hopefully you should all be able to see my screen there. So we had 44 experts to consider three questions. What do you see as the opportunities and impacts of incorporating ecocide into Scots law? What do you see as the barriers to the development and implementation of the law? And what should the relationship be between domestic and international criminalization? So I hope uh, my headlines will draw the themes together from Anna's and Monica's um, initial discussions. So in terms of question one, what are the opportunities and impacts? So as Anna and Monica have said really eloquently, um, an ecocide law would provide the ultimate sanction to deter and punish the worst polluters. 
This would send a strong message to the UK government and add momentum to the global campaign. As Monica has said, introducing an ecocide law in Scotland would have a deterrent effect on the activities of companies and individuals because they would be held directly accountable. This could incentivize a systems change in encouraging businesses tra to transition to more sustainable practices and motivate the finance and insurance industries to avoid supporting activities which might result in ecocide level damage. But the primary concern that came from our experts is that whereas there's a strong argument for ecocide as an international crime, the current extent of ecological and harm and degradation in Scotland is due to the lack of enforcement of existing environmental laws. The process of incorporation may act as distraction from addressing these significant problems in environmental governance. And as I said, environmental governance is about how we administer our laws, how we regulate our laws, and how we have access to justice. So since the launch of our free advice service in June 2021, ERCS has responded to over 250 inquiries from across Scotland, and we've identified systemic failures in the enforcement of environmental regulations in regard to water and sewage pollution, sewage sludge, land contamination, the lack of accountability from regulators. What's more, when all else fails, we should be able to hold public bodies and polluters to account in a court of law. But access to civil justice and criminal justice is impossibly complex, inaccessible and unaffordable. And this is why Scotland remains in breach of the United Nations Aarhus Convention. Please go to our website to find out more about what needs to change, including an enforceable right to a healthy environment and a dedicated Scottish environment call. So what are the barriers to the development and implementation of ecocide law in Scotland? So the barriers to the development of ecocide law broadly fall into three categories, philosophical, legal and political. So as Anna and Monica said, although ecocide has been talked about since the 1970s, it's a relatively new legal concept uh, in terms of a relationship to Scotland's legal framework. There are also philosophical questions relating to the purpose and intent of criminal law. So as we've said, this is meant to be a deterrent. Is there a place for signalling legislation in Scots criminal law? Um, that is, if the law might never be used. Should criminal law even be used to address serious environmental destruction? The legal and technical barriers include thresholds for culpability, the difficulties of accounting for cumulative impacts, so cumulative environmental damage over time, and uncertainty over how ecocide would fit within Scotland's existing environmental governance regime. So we already have environmental liability regulations and they operate to prevent environmental damage or remedy damage that's already been committed. So where would ecocide fit? If ecocide is defined as an unlawful activity, what about the government's actions in providing licenses that damage the environment now or in the future? They're lawful because the government has done them. So for example, licenses for scallop dredging or the use of PFAS for other chemicals or fossil fuel extraction and production. We need clarity on whether an ecocide law would overhaul the role and jurisdiction of our current regulators, such as the Scottish, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, our current prosecution service and police, or would it be designed to supplement existing legislation? So these are all questions that need to be teased out, we need to sort of struggle with in terms of the development of the bill. Political barriers focus on the practicalities of introducing ecocide with devolved competencies. So whereas we might be able to introduce it within our devolved competence, how would it work cross boundary within UK jurisdictions? So for example, between Scotland and England or between Scotland and Northern Ireland. But on the other hand, this could be a positive incentive and opportunity for strengthening environmental protection across the UK. Would we bring everybody up? If we did an ecocide law in Scotland, would it encourage the other jurisdictions to also introduce one? And as Monica's already said, we must build cross-party support if an ecocide law can be passed before the next 2026 election. So finally, the barriers to implementation. Well, the barriers to implementation 
as always, and they are with the current enforcement and environmental regulation, are about skills training, resourcing issues, the current state of our environmental governance regimes I've already described being in chaos, and the lack of robust evidence base of environmental data. So time and again, we are confronted with CEPA's failure to maintain comprehensive data and registers of permits and pollution controls. Without this, how can we gauge the extent of environmental damage? So as somebody has already mentioned in the chat, should we not be focusing our energy in making CEPA stronger and ensure that our current environmental regulatory regime is fit for purpose? So what should the relationship be between domestic and international criminalization? Um, so as we already talked about, part of the philosophical question is new legislation should only be introduced if it addresses a gap in existing Scots law. And the roundtable noted that it's unclear whether an ecocide case currently exists in Scotland. On the other hand, <laughs> Domestic and international criminalization of ecocide are unavoidably interdependent. Ecocide law needs to be practically implemented at a state level for the international prosecution mechanism to function. And vice versa, awareness of the international crime and related sanctions could have a deterrent effect domestically. Another question is the reach of prosecution and whether this law would allow for prosecuting Scottish entities committing ecocide abroad. And we assume it would need to cover foreign entities com um, committing ecocide in Scotland. And finally, as Monica and Anna have already mentioned, it's all about definitions. So we considered uh, Stop Ecocide Foundation's definition of international ecocide, which uh, Monica has, has used for her uh, proposed members bill. How suitable is this for the Scottish context? The EU has a slightly amended definition, and while it'd be great to standardise definitions across jurisdictions, uh, and that might strengthen the international case for ecocide, it might render the law less applicable to Scotland. So instead of a fixed definition, we might need to have revisions both internationally and domestically. So these are some of the thorny questions our round table uh, tackled, grappled with, and our report will consider them in more detail. So I'll end by saying, it's complex, isn't it? We don't yet have all the answers, but we are only at the start of the journey. Thank you. And over to you, Benji. Thanks so much, uh, Shivali, for that very succinct but comprehensive summary of the roundtable and some of the key questions we'll need to grapple with in this bill. Uh, we're now going to move to the Q&A section. But first of all, I just want to thank all of our speakers very much for making the time to speak today, Anna Madrick, Monica Lennon, and Charlie Fifield, and sharing uh, their thoughts on uh, this really important topic. And we're not going to have time for all of the questions, so I've tried to summarise um, the, the key recurring questions which have been coming up, and I'm going to ask the panel uh, some of those now just to get their thoughts on some of the recurring issues which are coming up. The first one uh, is around sanctions and penalties for ecocide and whether um, the proposal could better take account of restorative justice, um, in particular thinking about how to not just prevent damage but uh, restore nature after damage and create a punishment that fits the crime. So there was ideas around uh, guilty parties having to engage and work around repairing the damage in the environment that they've created um, or using co company assets to clean up, uh, to pay to clean up environmental damage. So if I could just get some thoughts from the panel uh, on those questions, that would be great. Uh, first of all, let's start with uh, Anna. Sure. Um, yeah, really good question. And you actually hit on something which is quite novel around ecocide law. Um, it's something I've myself have researched in quite a bit. Um, Restorative justice is, of course, essential to environmental offences, and ecocide law has been drafted with a view to certain issues that restorative justice deals with. Um, so one of the major issues in attributing liability in environmental offences is that often damage is very far removed in time and place and circumstance. And as the, the asker of the question probably understands, um, restorative justice can speak to this. So it can address more intangible forms of damage, um, highlight the invisible victims um, in a much more direct way. Um, the, the Rome Statute actually includes provision for restorative justice. Um, under Article 53, they 
Um, there is inclusion for um, victims um, to join proceedings. And this has been said to have, have had a very transformative effect on criminal justice. So I think that absolutely there are avenues here. Um, and in light of the, the punishment element, because this is something that people can often get a little bit bogged down by, um, ecocide law really is, is in, in following on from what Shivali said, um, yes, it is about signaling and yes, it is about providing enforceable standards. But what the theme that I was really trying to push in my speech is, is this new paradigm of dealing with the environment. Um, of course, we can't, as uh, I read one of the questions, we can't speak to this without hitting the actions at the top. Um, and ha having this very strong deterring crime can affect action across the whole supply chain. Um, but that doesn't mean that ecocide law can and should work in isolation. Um, as I spoke to in my speech, the unlawful part of the, def the definition would invoke existing laws. So it, it, ecocide law wouldn't be derogating from existing law, it would actually be providing another way to apply those at the same time. Um, and I mean, other conversations, um, which would probably be quite suitable in the Scottish context, given the ecocide law will be domestic, could be around graduated sanctions. Um, so having, you know, different degrees of ecocide, depending on, you know, the level of intent or how significant the environmental damage was. Um, so I think what, what I'm really trying to emphasize here is that, uh, yes, opportunities for restorative justice, I think that this should be, I mean, it's philosophically included in the ecocide law debate, uh, but also on a practical level. Um, but also to remember that this is an evolving conversation, um, as you know, the consultation is happening at the moment, and it'd be really great for everybody here to give their views to this. Um, and, you know, perhaps e Scotland's version of ecocide law would need to look more at these kind of questions. Um, so yeah, com completely legitimate and totally possible. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Would anyone else like to come in, Shivali or Monica? Yeah, happy to come in, Benji. And thank you for all the questions. I think it was Janet who said um, restoring nature needs to be part of this discussion around restorative justice. So I think that's a really excellent point and that should be made in, in, the, in the consultation. But I agree with what Anna has said, and I think it's good to get some of that that context that, that she's given. Um, but I think if we're really serious about preventing ecocide from happening and dealing with it appropriately when it does happen, then we've got to recognise that in some of these cases, we will be seeing the destruction of whole ecosystems um, and also um, human life being endangered in many of these examples as well. So I want people to bear in mind the, the gravity of, of the impact. That's what we're that's what we're talking about. I also hope there's going to be a big um, opportunity for education around this and real sort of cultural change. Um, I spent a lot of time during 2023 visiting local schools in my parliamentary region, that's central Scotland. Um, so I represent um, schools and, and young people in, in Lanarkshire and in Falkirk. And we took the Ecoside Law campaign into schools and met with eco committees in the primary schools and rights respecting school committees and, and young people um, and pupil parliaments right across um, central Scotland. And they really get this and they really understand it. And actually some of them um, kind of frightened me that some say 20 years in prison is not long enough for ecocide criminals. So it's interesting, um, again, depending on who the audience is, um, there is a real anger, particularly with younger people who feel that, that many of us are not doing enough to protect their, their futures. Um, but I also recognise that we do have in Scotland alone, um, prisons that are bursting at, at the seam. So what we frame as a deterrent doesn't always work in, in practice. Um, but again, I think there's there's absolutely space in the consultation process for these um, other perspectives to, to be shared. Um, so thank you for, for the questions. Thanks, Monica. Shivali, did you want to come in on this? Or shall I move on? Great. So the next a uh, few questions focused on effectiveness. Um, yeah, some skepticism in terms of, yeah, whether it's enforceable and how to enforce it, um, whether prosecution would actually have a real effect on corporate behavior and also um, drawing parallels with um, the case being brought forward by South Africa against Israel around genocide at the moment and uh, how international law seems to have been uh, quite weak in terms of being able to prevent uh, 
harm being um, perpetrated in Gaza at the moment and whether ecocide would be any different, especially if it clashes with uh, profit margins of biz big business. Would anyone like to respond to that from the panel? So, or speak more generally to themes around enforceability. Shivali? Um, I can start with uh, in the Scottish context and then perhaps hand over to you, Anna, in terms of the international context, would that be helpful? So yes, I think, um, I think you know part of the questions that we've been exploring in 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 the round table and in the report that we're commissioning is all about enforceability and uh, as we know and i've stressed many times our current environmental regulations aren't enforced so that is a question it's about you know um as i've mentioned in in the slides it's about skills training it's about additional monies but it's also about the will to use the current enforcement powers so the representations we've made to environmental standards scotland and to scottish environment protection agency are all about saying you have powers now to address the pollution that our clients are experiencing. Why aren't you using them? I think the, um, the opportunity though, in terms of criminal law, and as Monica and Anna have said very eloquently, this is about the most severe crimes with the most utmost damage, is that it does, I think, uh, it, it's clearer. You know, it, it's a clearer identification of an issue and a clearer mainstreaming of prosecution and, and penalties. I think, Though, as I said, that can only happen if we have the right monitoring environmental data to begin with. So I think it's um, it's an important issue about enforcement in Scotland. We haven't got it well enough. And one of the ways we get it better is by using the court as the final place to say, you need to sort this out. And we can't even do that in Scotland yet. So all of these things need to be sorted out. Um, I think Anna, over to you in terms of the international context. Yeah, I think, well, very well worded. Um, I mean, to that, I would just add that um, an international crime of ecocide would be, it would be the first time that environmental law and criminal law have been conflated in this manner. Um, so environmental law is generally not enforceable, um, not only due to the fact that it needs to be, it needs to have a certain level of balance in order to accommodate for other rights. Um, so an ecocide law, I will mention, is also drafted with a view to this. And when I talked about not wanting to criminalize the ordinary actions of people, um, all environmental law involves some kind of balancing act because it's understood there's no action that we can take without ecological imprint. And that's why it's really important that we go after the big polluters. Um, we want to just transition. Um, but in, I mean, in terms of the in terms of the enforceability aspect, uh, even the strongest international environmental laws are drafted in such a way, um, such as ozone depleting and, and measures, um, are still drafted in such a way as to allow for economic um, or in other circumstances, military considerations. Um, the environment just doesn't have its own voice. And part of what's striking about the ecocide law debate is even the word ecocide. Um, people know intuitively what it means. And this is why the, the Stop Ecocide campaign is you know, very much composed of both civil society awareness and um, leveraging at the state level, because in order for a crime to be effective, of course, there needs to be awareness around it. And ecocide law, as I think Monica and I both spoke to quite a lot, is really about starting to implement this new system, um, this new new treatments and considerations of the environment, because it doesn't matter what law we have on paper, if there isn't the attitudes around how important the environment is to enforce it with, for example, a crime like ecocide at the top, which signals that the state and the people within the state do consider this. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's very difficult to reach enforceability because it's it's more about the attitudes that are applying the law um, rather than the fact that we don't have law. I mean, there's no shortage of environmental laws all over the world. Um, so the, the ecocide law campaign is also very much centered on trying to change this well, I would say wrong conception um, of how we do treat the environment. Uh, and that's where the enforceability part probably most comes in. Um, but of course I can speak more to that if there's something else. Uh, thanks very much. I think we are running low on time. So probably just one last question for the panel, um, which I'm gonna ask now. Um, and this was from Nicola from Commonweal, which was about uh, asking where the line would be drawn between ecocide and acts of pollution that are currently legal. Uh, so, for example, um, excess carbon emissions, which have been released knowingly in the face of the carbon emer climate emergency. So would ecocide first increase the penalty for activities already deemed illegal or would it make it easier to, to prosecute them as a first step? Shivali. 
Yeah, if I can go first, perhaps, and then um, over to you, Monica. Um, so I think this is a uh, this is a really important question we need to grapple with, because currently, as as we've talked about, there are certain acts which are lawful. They're within the government's purview. They have been licensed fossil fuel extraction, fossil fuel production, use of chemicals um, and uh, our air quality standards in terms of uh, pollution, air pollution. So um, these are not unlawful. So where, where would we use an ecocide law in that? But what we could use and what we should be using is holding uh, government to account on having improved standards on air quality and also um, challenging their current breaches of their own um, legislation on air quality standards. And I think uh, what Monica and Anna said very clearly is that ecocide, an ecocide bill must work in tandem with the right to a healthy environment. So there is a question again about, uh, do we use uh, ecocide in terms of a criminal uh, uh, way of working on environmental damage, or do we use a rights-based approach? But we can use both, can't we? So a rights-based approach, approach is the right to a healthy environment. So I'd be invoking the right to clean air as one of our six substantive features in challenging uh, the issues around air pollution and land pollution. And then we would be able to do that through the civil, um, the civil justice process of judicial review. Um, Monica. Thanks. No, you've answered that really well, Shivali. And, and these are crucial questions that as the, the Members Bill hopefully makes its way through Parliament and gets to a committee for in-depth scrutiny, these are the kind of questions um, that will be tested. Um, so it's really good that I'm getting so much advice and, and support um, on this call and, and elsewhere. I think I would just reinforce that that we, we're talking about mass environmental damage so think about the, the extreme situations that seem very unlikely and far-fetched, but but they're not. But that's what we're that's what we have in our, our sites here. And Chevalier's correct. Um, sometimes acts of ecocide could be connected to activities that are lawful, uh, have um, a permit or a license or, or another a consent. Um, but overstep the mark or, or or cause a pollution or an incident that that really could not pass any reasonable tests um and go beyond that that probably brings me on to in the very brief time we have you know SEPA has been mentioned other enforcement bodies so one argument put to me is that well let's just do enforcement better let's just resource the system we have better let's improve those checks and balances but even if the cabinet secretary came along with a big bag of money for SEPA, which she's not doing, there might be a little bit of extra money for SEPA. But today I, I asked Maddie McAllen at, at committee if she expects SEPA to do more around enforcement. And she's, well, that's, that's really a matter for SEPA. That's not for me to tell them. So we know on this call there are huge issues around um, environmental governance and access to, to justice. I think that ecocide law can be part of that scaffolding that we need. I think it can help to strengthen uh, and reinforce the existing regulations we have, but it also helps to fill some of the gaps that we know exist and some of the loopholes and people with very deep pockets and very good lawyers can work around systems and try and say, well, we're just within this threshold of this particular piece of legislation. So I think ecocide law, um, you know, again, it's not it's not a magic bullet, but I think it, again, it brings it higher up the political agenda. And I think if you're in the corporate world, the reputational risk of being accused of being an ecocide criminal, I think that's really, really serious. That could have an impact even in terms of, you know, sponsorship and advertising. You could become a bit of a, a corporate pariah, um, consumers could really turn your the back on you if they think that you're guilty of ecocide. So again, it's another device that we, I think we have to, to use, but we need to test it out um, during this consultation. And as I say, I'm learning from other countries about what they've been doing and what they're proposing to do. And that's why the work of Stop Ecocide International is so important because they are really, um, you know, 
out there in the field with grassroots campaigners, but also speaking to governments and key decision makers right around the world. So I don't want Scotland to to trail behind. I want us to be a trailblazer on this and I hope together we can achieve that. Thanks very much, Monica. We've got to leave it there, but I just want to first thank our panel, Shivali Fifield from the Environmental Rights Centre for Scotland, Anna Madrick from Stop Ecoside International, and Monica Lennon, MSP from Scottish Labour. 